It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of July 13th, 2001. We have four notable movies to take a look at today, so let's go ahead and jump on another into it, and we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend. That's Reese Witherspoon starring in Legally Blonde. What? I need someone serious. Rejected. You're in love with you. Replaced. I'm here to stay on set. I'm sorry, I just hallucinated. it. But this summer, you got into Harvard Law? What, like a tarp? She's getting educated. Do you understand what subject matter jurisdiction is? Well, I didn't think so. And get an even a total idiot. Match match. Reese Witherspoon, Legally Blonde, rated PG-13, starts Friday, July 13th. So Legally Blonde is the story of Elle Woods, played, by, of course, by Reese Witherspoon, who's a sorority girl who attempts to win back her ex-boyfriend uh, by getting a Juris Doctor degree at Harvard Law School and, in the process, overcome stereotypes against blondes and triumph as a successful lawyer. Uh, this is based off of a uh, this is based off of a novel of the same name, and the writer this actually, you know, had experiences going to Stanford Law School when being obsessed with fashion and beauty, reading Elle magazine, and frequently clashing with the personality of her peers. And she actually met with one of the producers and helped her develop the, the manuscript into her novel. And the book actually became a movie before the, I believe the book even came out, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, this was the movie that kind of launched Reese Witherspoon as a superstar. Like, it, it really brought her into the stratosphere as a leading actress and overall showing that, hey, she's got the capability to handle a movie like this. And while she definitely is the one of the best things about the movie in general... I don't know. Maybe it's just because I'm a guy. I never got into the Legally Blonde movies, honestly. Like I get, a, I get into a lot of these type of films. Legally Blonde never really did it for me. Maybe because I saw it in an early age, and th I actually went to see it in theaters because my sister wanted to see it when that came out. I just never really got into it myself. I mean, it's not a bad movie per se. It just really doesn't do anything that significant in terms of a story department. You can kind of predict everything that's going to happen. You can predict how it's going to end. And there's really not a whole lot of surprises overall in the final climax of the movie, which, which, uh, but it's not, like I said, it's not a bad movie. It's just not my personal taste. I mean, I've liked movies like this that are similar. And I think the casting, I think, really does carry the film overall for me to say that it's not a bad movie. It's just a passable film. I think it definitely does show Reese Witherspoon's potential as a leading actress, which it would later show in a couple of years when she'd be accepting the Oscar for Walk the Line. And you also got Luke Wilson, Selma Blair, Victor Garber from Alias, and Jennifer Coolidge from the American Pie movies. But um, yeah, this thing has had a legacy of its own. It spawned sequels, directed video sequels. There was even talks of a third movie for the longest time that I guess is not happening right now, even though it's even though it's some say it's still in development. I think the last time I heard about it, Mindy Kaling was actually working on it, but um, that was a couple years ago. So I don't know what the status is on that one. But um, like I said, it's not a bad movie per se. It's just not my type of thing. And like I said, I usually like these type of movies. I just didn't find this one that amusing in general. I just thought it was just okay for what it was. I think more of it comes from the, more of the enjoyment factor comes from Weiss Witherspoon, who does make this performance work, and the, and some of the songs in the soundtrack are actually pretty good. The Hoku song at the beginning, uh, Perfect Day, is surprisingly catchy as all hell. I mean, that's a great song. But, uh, yeah, overall, a decent film, but I'm not the type, but it's not my thing, honestly. I've seen much better movies that are similar to this. Like I said, not a bad movie per se, just one that didn't quite live up to what I thought it was going to. Um, so, that's Legally Blonde for you. So let's go ahead and move on to our next movie, which is Frank Oz's The Score. No more jobs, this is the last one I'm doing. I quit. Quit now. Bypassed the surveillance. I run this operation down to the smallest detail. Your boss is elevated detection. We gotta go now, but we don't go at all. Now, the only threat that remains is the one he never expected. Hold it right there. Robert De Niro, Edward Norton. This is over now, and you've got to deal with it. It's not over yet. The score. Rated R. This Friday in theaters everywhere. So yeah, a very different movie from Frank Oz, who's done a lot of comedies, mostly uh, What About Bob, House Sitter, most recently both, most recently at the time, Bowfinger. So a very different type of film for him to work on here. He's also got three generations of method actors in this movie. you got Robert De Niro starring as an aging thief whose specialty is safe-cracking and who's on the verge of retiring to li live a life at ease with his girlfriend, played by Angela Bassett. But before he can ride off into the sunset, he's pressured to do one last job by his mentor and business partner, played by Marlon Brando. This is actually the last movie Marlon Brando did before he passed away. And uh, he's plotting the heist of the Montreal Customs House, and he's got a man on the inside, played by Edward Norton, who's a talented but volatile crook who has managed to inter 
integrate himself with the faculty staff, and a fellow employee suffers from cerebral palsy as well. Uh, Jackie bristles at Nick's interference in the score. However, he threatens violence when it seems he's going to be cut out of the action. In the meantime, Nick grows increasingly ill and eases into the operation as it violates his two most important dictums in theory. Always work alone and never pull a job in your own city. Uh, yeah, this is another one of those movies where it did pretty well with critics. Got a decent, got an overall decent critical response. Got a, a decent box office in general, but um, I don't remember really too much about it. And I feel like a movie, it's, it's felt like a movie that really Frank Oz, I think, was a little bit too much for. Like I said, he direct he's, before this, he was direct, directing mostly comedies and mostly, like, he, yeah, most of the movies he did in between, is he did, were comedies. I mean, Dark Crystal, maybe not a comedy, but that was more in line with what he did with The Muppets. And Muppets Take Manhattan's another example. Little Shop of Horrors, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, What About Bob, House Sitter. Indian the Cupboard, In and Out, Bowfinger. After this, he would do The Stefford Wives and then Death of the Funeral. So this is a guy that has a lot of com comedic credits to it, and now he's directing a dramatic movie, and I really do think that not really being adjusted to that kind of hurt him in the long run. In fact, Marlon Brando reportedly clashed with him on the set of this movie, but then again, Marlon Brando clashes with anybody on set. I mean, like, go back and look at the stories of The Island of Dr. Moreau, but... um. I don't know. The movie is not bad, per se. It's just not a movie that I think does anything that spectacular or new or anything uniquely different. Like a movie like um, like Ocean's Eleven, which is another, this is another heist movie that came out this year. That was I guess there was like a heist movie boost after maybe Entrapment, I guess. I don't know. But like Ocean's Eleven really showed what you can do with a modern day a heist movie and give it its own unique edge to it. But movies like this and movies like Swordfish, I don't think really did the trick in general. And again, I think it's just bad. It's just, I think it's just not a movie where Frank Oz really could fit the role for this as a director. I feel like he should have gotten somebody with a more dramatic background to really make this work on its own. But as it is, I mean, it's not a bad movie per se. It is cool to see Brando and De Niro working on screen with each other. The only time they would ever do that, but at the same time, there's really nothing else there to make this kind of stand up as something that you need to see or something that should be seen as a, a master craftsman of filmmaking. It's just not really anything, really. It's just mostly a mediocre film in general, like a film that you expect so much more from, but you never really get what you really want from it when it's all said and done. Um, kind of a letdown film in general, so... Um, and uh, speaking of letdowns, that perfectly segues into our next movie, which is Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. I mean, from that trailer alone, that was my first real introduction to Final Fantasy when I saw that trailer on some Sony videos back in the day, and I was just like, what is this? I mean, what is Final Fantasy? I kind of want to see what this movie was about in general. And um, so Final Fantasy The Spirits Within is notable for a number of different things. One, it was the first photorealistic computer animated feature film, and for the, for the longest time, it was the most expensive video game-inspired movie of all time. 
You follow a story of the scientists, the key Ross and Dr. Sin, in their efforts to free a post-apocalyptic Earth from a mysterious and deadly alien race known as the Phantoms, which had driven the remnants of humanity into barrier cities. Uh, a key and Sin must fight against General Hine, who wants to use more violence means to end the conflict. And this was notable for a number of different reasons. And, as, and uh, as somebody who's never really played the Final Fantasy games and don't really know much about the franchise as a whole, I saw the movie back then as a newcomer, and even today... I still don't know too much about the Final Fantasy franchise, so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, what is this? this? And I is then like, when you think of Final Fantasy, this was not what I was thinking when I think when I think of Final Fantasy. I feel like this is a film that I don't know. It didn't really feel like what I thought Final Fantasy was when I first heard about this. But um, I like the movie, but it's mostly for the technical stuff. I think the movie looks gorgeous in terms of a visual style. It's still pretty impressive computer animation in general, and a lot of it kind of still holds up, even by today's standards. Uh, the characters' designs still look realistic, and that was one of the biggest things about this movie. They look so realistic, you're forgetting you're watching a CG animated movie. Like, there was a thing that they had with the main character of this movie, Aki, and the whole thing about Aki Ross was that she was supposed to be seen as the next, bi the next big step in, movie for in movies. Like, she's going to be the first digital actress that we're going to put in movies. They even put her in Maxim Magazine as one of the Hot 100 to increase the media attention for the movie, which, I mean, it looks fine, I guess, but when you really take a look at it, just look right here. I mean, she looks fine, except for the fact that the eyes really look a little too much like a CG character. I mean, at the time, I, th I think most people bought into it, but at the same time, though, like, they thought that this was going to be the future. Like, we were going to put digital actors in here... And, like, that was going to be the future of the movies in general. But, um, uh, obviously that didn't really pan out, I think, as much as they wanted to. And I think that was what the movie Simone coming out the following year would kind of parody. The film did have a legacy to it in terms of CG effects and how they could make it and how it would later play it into effect in later years, specifically with the Avatar movies and what James Cameron was able to do with those. And kind of like with the Avatar movies, this movie really... Like, it really doesn't have a good story to work with here. I think there are elements here where I think it does work. I like the voice cast they have here. You got uh, Ming-Na from, from Mulan as the as a key, Alec Baldwin, Donald Sutherland, James Wood, Steve Buscemi, Perry Gilpin, Ving Rhames, and they work off each other very well. Like I said, the only real downside of the movie is the story. It is not an interesting story in the slightest. It's been there, done that. Very few surprises going into the movie, and when you see those twists and turns, it's just like... Like, it doesn't really surprise you whatsoever. It's not Argyle bad, where they th consistently keep throwing twists on you all the time. It's not. It's nowhere near that bad, but um, it's not great either. It's just, you kind of expect more in terms of the story department, but... I mean, it was a disappointment for some when it came out. It didn't really accomplish what I thought they what I think they wanted to accomplish from it, but... From a visual perspective, it still holds up after all these years. It's still a very solid film... But it really needed a much better story to make it spectacular. I think the animation and the CG work fine. And they make it worth a watch, especially if you're watching it on a Blu-ray. But it's a film that's okay for what it is. But it definitely was one of those ones where you feel like it could have been a whole lot better if the story had been much more clever and much more interesting in general here. But And even if you're a, new to, is it, if you're a newcomer to this series, this is probably not the best way to come into it. But, um, I mean, that's just how my I got into it. But, um... That's just my thoughts on Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. So let's go ahead and move on to our last movie that we have here, and that is Made. Hey, Jimmy, where are they taking us? Yeah, where are they going to whack us, Jimmy? We need guns. We don't need guns. I'm telling you, man, I'm pretty sure we need guns. I want you to take it back to the business class, round up a couple of honeys, and we're going to have kind of a pool party. Who am I dropping this off to? Who gets their hands on this? That's your pretty. Yeah. That's my premiere. And who do I give it to? So Made is notable for a number of reasons as well. Made is notable because it's the directorial debut of one John Favreau, who would later go on to have a very successful directing career after this. But um, he plays Bobby in this movie, and he's a struggling boxer and bodyguard for a stripper girlfriend, but he hates his work and wants to move up. So he agrees to go to New York City for his boss to help the delivery for a money laundering scheme his partner in crime is his best friend Ricky, played by Vince Vaughn, who's an obnoxious loudmouth, who has seen one too many mafia movies. Bobby tries to keep it cool and get the job done, but Ricky's antics threaten to blow the entire situation up. And some people say that this is a sequel to uh, Swingers, because they were both in that movie. But um, it's been commonly misconceived as one. It's not a sequel to Swingers, nor is it really 
as good as Swingers. I think a film like Swingers really was something that was revolutionary for the time period. And this one is not as good. It feels like it's trying a little... It doesn't really know what kind of a tone it wants to set. But that being said, though, it is still a very funny movie. There's still a lot of great funny elements to it. It has a great cast to work with. Uh, Peter Falk, Sean Combs, uh, P. Diddy, of course. Uh, Falka Jansen, uh, Faison Love, you know. Um, it's a pretty good cast in general in here. A good idea in general as well. But like I said... A lot of the comedy in here doesn't really fly as well as it's something like in um, Swingers, but it definitely showed that there was some promise with the with, with the direction of with what John Favreau could do as a director and why these two John Favreau and Vince Vaughn work well off each other. But like I said, it doesn't have those many memorable moments that's, that a movie like Swingers does. But for a follow-up film with the two of them, I guess I could be expecting a lot worse. It's not a bad film per se. It's just more of a letdown. It's a letdown, but not a letdown where it's just like I didn't like the movie in general. I still like the movie very much, but like I said, it definitely could have been a whole lot better considering what they had going for it. But um, again, it showed what John Favreau can do as a as a director, and he would later show that capability, show the capabilities with his next film, and certainly with the films he would do after that. And uh, he's proven to be one of our great directors since then. And uh, Made was kind of the first film that really showed what he can do as a director. It's a showcase for him, really. Uh, Vince Vaughn, I mean, Vince Vaughn is very good in the film as well, too. It's a good film. Like I said, don't just don't, don't go in there expecting another Swingers, because it's not quite that whatsoever. So that's Made. And on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. We'll head into the middle of July next time with four movies, including Jurassic Park 3. Can it break the mold of the last movie, The Lost World Jurassic Park, which was one of the worst movies I've ever seen? Can it, can it really come back to the magic that made Jurassic Park possible? Yes and no, but we'll talk about that next time. We'll also look at the star-studded romantic comedy, Julia Roberts, Billy Crystal, John Cusack, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and America's Sweethearts. We also have Hedgewick and the Angry Inch, Itch... Hedwig and the Angry Inch. I kept reading, I kept reading it as Angry Itch, but Hedwig, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Right, John Cameron Mitchell's film. And we also have Terry's Wygoff's Ghost World featuring Thor Birch and a, Scar and a priest lost in translation, Scarlett Johansson. So we'll take a look at all four of those movies next time. So until then, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So with that said, I'm off. I will see you guys next time. And until then, as always, take care.